As we begin this message this morning, I want to just take a minute and word of prayer. Some of these subjects that we talk about, as I've said many times before, we cannot exhaust them because and I'm going to speak personal here, my mind is not capable of receiving and understanding all the wonderful, profound truths in this book. We see through a glass darkly, and sometimes it's darker than others. You, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's real dark. Sometimes it's just light gray. Um, but this one here has shades of gray to very dark. So, Lord, help us. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. And our teacher is the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, give us a desire to know truth above all else. For you yourself said, ye shall know the truth. It's knowing the truth that sets us free. And we thank you, Lord, for helping us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as this congregation well knows, you can talk about things in this church that you don't talk about in other churches. Yes, we do make political statements. Several of the people here have made political statements, not just myself. Because in the early American churches, in the colonial churches, they talked about the threat from Great Britain. They were open about it. And... The preachers, some of them, history tells us, even had on a military uniform Amen. Amen. under their yeah. ministerial cloak. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to preach and they were willing to fight. Amen. So we have come to a day in which church the institutionalized church has become somewhat anemic. Yes. Uh, they've lost their iron. Yes. And therefore, it's keep the peace, don't rock the boat, yes. don't offend anyone. Well, Jesus offended people quite often. And even the Apostle Paul said, Have you become my enemy because I tell you the truth? So, the men of the past, the great apostles of the past, were men that had a steel backbone. They would speak up just like the prophets. And they saw the inside of several jailhouses. So we're actually doing real well because I've never seen the inside of a jailhouse Amen. except when I visited yes. my friends. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and I have visited them. Yes. But today we're going to cover several different subjects. And let's start in the book of 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter Three. This planet that we are living on has experienced two earth ages and yet to experience a third one. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 
verse 5, And for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world, number one, that then was, that's the first earth age, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and earth which are now, that's number two. That's the present earth age in which we are living, which are now. By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Let's jump down to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all godly conversation and God, holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to His promise, look for, number three, a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness." Now, I realize that some of these passages can be interpreted different ways. You may see them in a different light than I do. But what I see in verse, in verse say, 7, kept in store against reserved unto judgment, fiery judgment, it does not necessarily mean that the earth itself, planet earth, is going to be burned up. It's the social order, the social system, the governments that are going to be overthrown. So we can say the political, social, economic, and military complex is going to be overthrown. Now there's a lot to say about that in the book of Revelation but we won't go there because it, it will, um, well, it's, it's worthy going there, but we don't have the time. But the third earth age, what we are looking for is the third earth age. Verse 17, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Not another planet but another earth age where the social order is based upon righteousness and godliness. And Christ is the head. And in Revelation we read verse 21, chapter 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea or turmoil among nations. Now, in verse number 5 of the text that we read, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. If you differ with me, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But in Genesis 1, 1, it said, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now, to me, this is the first creation not the Adamic creation. This is the first earth age. And the earth was without form and void. 
something happened so that a social order was overthrown between verse 1 and verse 2 that is not described for us. And the earth was. Now this word was is, is translated became. And we see this in Jeremiah chapter 4. Excuse me. Jeremiah 4, verse 33, 23. I'll get it together here. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. I believe that Jeremiah was describing the overthrow of the first earth age. Now, in verse number 2 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, And the earth was without form and void. And then it says, Darkness, darkness was upon the face of the deep. But yet in verse 1, it says, God created the heavens. Well, what was, what's in the heavens? The sun, the moon, and the stars, and they give light. But yet, in verse 2, there was total darkness. So there must have been an overthrow. And it says, And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now the word waters and the word deep are synonymous. So, there was this planet that was covered with water. And it had to be covered with water before God made Adam and before God made the firmament and the waters in verse 6. And before God made the light, or restored the light, in verse 3. So, we are faced with this question. Now, there is a Christian society, in fact, I think two of them, that strongly stress that this planet is 6,000 years old. And I was listening to the radio program of one of these uh, Christian societies from California. And it said, well, science says that fossil fuel is a result of once living matter compressed under much pressure, heat, and time. And fossil fuel, this, this living matter was once in existence thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of years ago. But they refuted that and they said that God just simulated everything to look like that. And I thought to a, a non-scientific mind, even that's not an answer. Just God simulated it because the people are strict, strict, literal creationists. We do not believe in Darwinism. We don't believe in that type of theory. But I'm not restricting God's plan to just 6,000 years ago because I think that there would be 
uh, too many questions unanswered. So, Adam lived 6,000 years ago. But the earth possibly has been here millions of years. And verse number three. After the Spirit of God moved upon the deep, then day and night were restored. God said, let there be light, etc. And God, verse number six, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And he called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the first, second day. Now, then he begins the creation of vegetation. And it says, and I'm just going to kind of skip through this, let the waters under the heaven, verse 9, be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And then he says, let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit and then he says I'm going to put a principle in my creation an irrevocable principle of my creation that whatever I make I want it to perpetuate after its own kind and therefore if you plant a uh, a particular tree, an apple tree, there's something in that seed. If you plant that seed, it's going to bring forth apples. Peach, the same way, or any other, I mean, a weed. You know, a, a stink weed. It's going to bring forth more stink. <laughs> because the seed... The, uh, the life-giving seed principle is in that plant. Yes. Amen. And, you know, you can pray for your fruit trees to survive the winter and Amen. bugs and everything else. But you don't, go, you don't have to go outside and lay hands on that tree and say, Lord, let this thing produce apples. It's going to do that already. That's the natural thing. Whose seed is in itself. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, herb yielding seed after his kind, tree and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And then it says, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. Now, in verse 21, God created great whales and great living creatures that moved, which the waters brought forth. This is fish and fowl. After their kind, every winged fowl, after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Amen. And then we come to verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle, creeping thing, beast of the earth after his kind. 
And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And then we come to verse 26. God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and he did not say after their own kind. Do we have a problem? Number one, vegetation, fish and fowl, plants were not made in God's image. That's a number one. Number two, man, Adam man, is made, created in the image of God. And the second thing, he was given a law. Amen. Right from the very beginning. Animals follow instinct. They are automatically going to breed with their own kind. And, you know, you can put horses and cows in the same pasture. And I think that the chance of interbreeding is extremely low. <laughs> but God created man higher than the animals and therefore he put them in charge of something. He gave them dominion. And in this garden he put a tree, put two trees among others. And he said, this tree This is chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Animal life, plant life, was never given the choice to pick from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. But man was. But God gave this creation, Adamic creation, a law. Do not touch this tree. Now, there's a lot of discussion as to what the tree was. Personally, I don't think anyone has full light on it. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 16 different descriptions. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. This creation is given responsibility. He's given knowledge. He is giving, given reasoning power. Whereas plants, animals, and fowl, they operate on a, if I can say, a pre-programmed DNA. Whereas man has the capability to disobey God. And therefore, he gave Adam... He created Adam, but it does not say in there that you breed after your own kind. 
But the implication of law that had already gone before in God's creation, he said he thought it was a real good idea that everything would produce after its own kind. So why would there be an exception to Adam kind? You follow me? Why would God say, okay, it's open, it's all right. It was man's, fallen man's concept Amen. and prerogative to disobey not only to uh, bring forth or to mate after another kind, but also to commit murder, yes. lie, steal, and every other sin. So in the beginning when God created Adam, even though he did not say, bring forth after your own kind, neither did he say, do not steal. Do not commit murder. Do not lie. He said that later on and it was codified. But in the beginning, the implication was that Adam was to bring forth after his own kind. Because he was in the image of God. And I think that could be explored quite extensively. God is not divided. Neither can you pollute him or dilute him. He remains the same. And I think, you know, there's many varieties of tomatoes. I do not know how many different varieties were in the garden, but I know that man has manipulated that since then. There's everything from, you know, there's a, you, you go to the seed store and you're, you're faced with this problem. What kind of tomato do you want? That's man's doings. And so is the mule. That's man's doings. But God's order was for everything to bring forth after his own kind. Another reason is that the law that God, or the, the, the creation of Adam, and the implied law, given to Adam, if it were disobeyed, could bring death to every part of creation. Because Adam was the federal head of all creation. He was the federal head. So therefore, God gave to Adam Verse 15, chapter 2, and, God, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, to dress it and to keep it, I think that even on an elementary level, we would have to say, keep it the way that God created it. Keep it and dress it. I do not believe that Adam had any intentions of going into the laboratory Amen. with a test tube and a Bunsen burner and figure out how can I make this fruit mix with this fruit. I don't think that crossed his mind. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest, and then comes the principle, the element of death. 
He said this to Adam. And later on, he said, you are going to make your living by the sweat of your brow and even some plants, thorns, you're going to have to fight through them to make something grow. Just plant a garden. You plant your beans, you plant your carrots, and you plant your whatever, and others show up. Weeds. You know, these thorny things. And all types just, it, it just volunteer. And really a weed, the definition of a weed is just simply a plant out of place. That plant has a right to live as much as a tomato plant. But he's just out of place. And like I saw a bumper sticker on the back bumper of a friend of mine's pickup said, have a nice day elsewhere. <laughs> the weed has a right to live. Have a nice day. But not in my garden. How did we get into all this? God gave Adam an intellect and a will. Because it says in 2.7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living person, a living soul. Now, in the making of man, God created a body. He created a body. It says, dust. Plus breath, dust plus breath equals a living soul, a living person. So it's body plus spirit because the breath was the spirit of God. There's body, which is dust, spirit, which is God's breath and it forms a living person. Now, as you can tell, I'm trying to weave my way <laughs> through this garden of many different intersections. This man, Adam, had an intellect, he had a will, he had emotions, he had reasoning power, he could communicate with God, and he could communicate with other forms of life that had an intellect also. Because Adam use your imagination, is walking around this garden and Adam gave names to all cattle, fowl of the air, every beast of the field. And that word beast means a living creature. Does not necessarily mean a quadruped animal. It already mentioned cattle. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. So he was all by himself. God gave Adam only the commandment not to touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve did not exist at the moment. He alone was given that commandment. 
Verse 21, And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. Let me say this. Was it just that one rib, that bone that is in your chest cavity that he took out? Because when God made Eve, we all know that it's Adam means ish. Woman means isha, which means a she-man. Don't carry this too far. <laughs> but there was a capability of components in Adam to make a female. The actual bone called the rib does not have that capability. So being that Adam was the first of his kind, Eve was the second after his kind, he took a woman, he took parts. <laughs> he did not make Eve directly from the dust. Is that good or bad? But he made woman from the dust man. And he made woman different. Different in physiology. Is that the right word? Yeah. In mentality, in emotions, and every way. He made women, women with charm that men do not have. And God made a woman, not another man. I mean, two plus two equals four. That when... Adam, when God said, Adam needs a helpmeet, he gave him a female. Amen. Now, he took the rib out of man, made he a woman, brought her unto Adam. And this is what Adam said. This is now, bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. If that's not kind after kind, what is? I think that Eve had the same color of skin that Adam had. Amen. And the same biorhythm yes. in the area of our sensate that Adam had. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And Adam is still talking. If I gather the text correctly. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Now Moses is writing this. We know. But Moses is putting a high priority upon a marital relationship. Amen. And they keep telling us correctly that the first institution on this planet was the home. Destroy the home, you're destroying the first institution that God created. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And he's putting 
Moses is writing this and he's putting a priority even over your relationship with your children. Because it actually says, leave. Leave. Doesn't mean hate or disrespect your parents. But it said, leave. And you cleave unto a helpmeet. I think there's a a whole seminar in that, but anyway. And then when we come to chapter 3, Paul tells us, and I made a scripture reference down here somewhere, Paul tells us that it was not Adam, but it was the woman that sinned. It was the woman that sinned. But Eve was at fault. But Adam was responsible because he was the head over his wife. And I have several scriptures down here. First Timothy. Let's turn there. For we can do more justice. First Timothy chapter two. First Timoth Timothy chapter two verse fourteen. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. But when they decided that they were naked, they both hid. And when we come down to chapter 3, going back to Genesis, chapter 3 and verse 8, the eyes of them both were opened. Eve communicated with a living creature of some kind. I do not believe it was a reptile. Reptiles, I don't think, ever had the capability of reasoning power or anything like that. So Eve was talking to a living creature that had intellect, that actually knew what God had said, and could give an argument back to Eve, And he knew just how to deceive the woman. He did not approach Adam. He approached Eve. And you know the story. Come down to verse 7, chapter 3. The eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked, both of them. Because the sin of Eve was Adam was held responsible. Therefore, both of their eyes were open, both of them were naked, and they came up with a plan to sew fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of God, they heard the voice of God in the garden, in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife 
hid from the presence of God. And the Lord God called who? Adam. Adam. He didn't call Eve. He called Adam. Said, where are you, Adam? And Adam answered, I heard your voice. I was afraid. I was naked. And I hid myself. The first humanistic religion. So we have this man that is a living soul. Dust. Spirit. Living person. Or living soul. Being held responsible. For a law that was broken. By his wife. But the wife. Did not receive that law directly from God. Only Adam did. But no doubt she knew about it and was instructed by Adam. But now they're both responsible. Now, what about this element of death? As I said before, there's dust, that's the human body. There's breath, and God breathed into man, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And he became a full person. It's like salt. There's two different elements in salt. There's this alkaline chemical called sodium. And then there's chloride. And they're two separate elements. And they have two different symbols in the element chart. But when you mix them together, you have a totally different element called salt. When you put this body of Adam, with the breath of God, you have these two elements together produce a living soul. But salt, a chemist, can take salt and divide it. Separate those elements. When your breath leaves your body, it's nothing but dust again. So therefore, if you remove one of the component parts of this living soul, you no longer have a living soul. And I know this goes against tradition. And one of the reasons why I'm talking about this is because I have been asked about this more than once. Probably one of the questions that I receive the most. What happens when you die? Well, what happens to this living soul? What happens to salt when these two elements are separated? You no longer have salt. And what happens to this living soul when the breath of God leaves it? Now, the Bible tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. That is found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17 and 11. But it's the life of the mortal flesh that's in the blood. It's the life of the mortal flesh is in the blood. Now, when Jesus was resurrected, in Luke chapter 24, he said this.
I'm going to read it. Luke 24. Behold my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. He never mentioned anything about blood. In fact, Paul said, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, the resurrected body as I see it, does not live by blood. The life of the blood, the life of the flesh man, right here, is in the blood in this mortal state. But in the resurrected state, there's no need for blood. We operate by resurrected spirit. When a person dies, Ecclesiastes tells us this. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8. Verse 8, there is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. There's no discharge in that war. You can't raise your hand, volunteer, I, I'm going to live forever. When Jesus died on the cross, now, we believe in the physical crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He was physically crucified. He was 100% man. He had a human body and he bled. Out come blood and water. How much blood and water came out? But Jesus himself and no other man could say. Now, let, let me back up. Did Jesus bleed to death? Or was there a point in this crucifixion that he said, I'm going to release my spirit? Father, into my hands I release my spirit. I commend my spirit. In other words, Jesus Christ actually bled, but he also had the power to release his spirit back to God. Every person, saint or sinner, when you die, your spirit goes back to God who gave it. Amen. Amen. And that is found in Ecclesiastes also. Yes. And your body decays. It's dust. What about the soul? The soul doesn't exist. Your, your person doesn't exist. But I believe, personally I believe, that your spirit that goes back to God can be, there's that potential or the possibility of that spirit being God conscious, but not earth conscious, until God chooses to use that spirit as a ministering angel. 
Now that's a gray area with some people. If you disagree, fine, we'll still be friends. But Moses was dead. And he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. Because, now this is another gray area. We, right now, you know, preachers have used the term for years and it's, it's okay. You need, your soul needs to be saved. It does. Transform your emotions, your will, your intellect, all that needs to be saved. But we who are joined with Christ, we are joined with Him by Spirit. Our spirit, man, is in training. People, I think most Christians never think of that. They can just go along life's pathway and never read the Bible, never, never really concentrate, never, you know, commune with the Lord. We're training our spirit because I believe that when a baby is born, at conception, God breathes into that embryo. Not at birth, but at conception. Breathes a particular it's the Spirit of God, but He breathes into that person the, pers the particular yes. personality. Yes. Amen. Yes. And we have a responsibility. We have a human responsibility. Keep yourself, Jude said, keep yourself yes. in the love of God. Amen. You know, we choose to do the right. Oh, we believe in election and all that, but we choose to do the right and refuse the wrong. Paul told Timothy, he was a young man, no doubt, and he said, flee youthful lust. In other words, Timothy, you have a responsibility. When you see lust available there, just turn and go the other way. That's your responsibility. You don't have to fast and pray for three days whether, whether to run off with that woman or not. No, you just flee. Go the other way. Human responsibility. We are in training for a greater calling than what we have now. And we are going to be in the kingdom of God what do you want to walk into the kingdom? When, however the kingdom unfolds, you want to walk in there the first day, so to speak, just a, a blooming idiot. I'm saved. What do I do now? All I want to do is just kiss Jesus' feet and, and, and find me a little mansion somewhere. Nonsense. We are being prepared for a kingdom to rule and to reign with Christ. So when you die, your spirit goes back to God who gave it. I believe, and I say I believe, that God can use a person. When Jesus was in the garden or the, the wilderness of temptation, when He was in the wilderness of temptation, you know, He fought with the devil. But it says that angels came and ministered unto him. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. My, this is, this is my interpretation. He was going through hardship. 
Had angels, the ones that were created higher than man, those heavenly beings, have they ever gone through hardship? No, but Jeremiah did. And Isaiah did. And all the prophets of old, they knew how to minister to one who was having difficulty while he was in, the, in that wilderness. I believe it could have been the spirit of one of the saints that had died in the Old Testament. Angel means messenger. Came and ministered unto him. Now this gets into an area of which is somewhat dubious. Somewhat foggy in some areas in some areas because you see these television programs where some of these stories I just do not believe and others there could be a measure of credibility in them for example we've all seen this and it's this seems to be somewhat of a common thing someone have an accident on the highway and dying and someone actually come and pull them out, we'll say, of a burning vehicle. And then disappear. Why not? Why not? Now, you know, the paranormal that some people get into, uh, such things as, well, I'm going to take my college exam and... You know, my mother that passed away last year, she really wanted me to graduate from college, so she's going to help me pass this test and give me the answers. You know, um, that is nothing but a person's imagination. And also some of these visions of hell or heaven. I think there's a shadow of incredulity there because one man famous evangelist on TV he was six hours in heaven according to his report and he and Jesus were telling jokes to one another and Jesus was laughing so hard at his jokes that Jesus was slapping his knee as they were walking through the field now personally I find no credibility in that whatsoever. That's foolishness. But it's good for stand-up comedy. And he's got, he's got all the people laughing and, and, you know, and before long there's an offering plate that's passed. <laughs> so, and so there's a lot of mysterious things in the spirit world good and bad but there are some things that's hard to understand now no doubt in this small congregation this morning there's folks that have experienced things that you cannot explain there's things that beyond the natural now personally I have, and, and I attribute it to the Spirit of God. I knew that someone had died. Because when I was driving that 18-wheeler, I felt death come in the cab. I knew it was death. I would have put my paycheck on it. I knew it was death. So I stopped and I called home. That was before cell phones. And I'm in some little roadhouse, really, in southern Arkansas. And Mary Lee told me that David Wysorek had been killed. And it was a, it was a shock, but I knew, I knew it was real. Um, 
it was, it was a shock. But yet, the Lord had already prepared me. Somebody had died. And that young man, 21 years old, three months, died in Kuwait after the truce was signed. After, just hours afterward. Stepped on a landmine. So, you know, the Lord has, the Lord can do anything He wants to. But I believe that God can and has used the spirits of just people, Christian people, that have gone on as ministering spirits. That spirit is God conscious, not earth conscious until God sends that spirit as a ministering angel. And I was teaching on this one day and some, when I finished my message, a young lady came up to me very excited and said, I want to tell you something. She said, my sister was dying and all the family was there in the hospital this girl was dying. And she said, we heard footsteps coming down the hall. And who walked in the door was our father that had passed on previously. She said, we saw him. Everyone saw him. He looked just like we knew him in the flesh. And he went up to the bed and talked to his daughter. matter of seconds then he disappeared well is that so much different than the Mount of Transfiguration so the Lord has put all these things because the ministry of angels Genesis 18, Adam, not Adam, but Abraham, was sitting in his tent door one day. Three men, it says men, and Sarah actually cooked them a meal. And they ate the meal. And one of them was a theophany of Jesus Christ himself. And he sent the other two down to check out the sin that was taking place in the city of Sodom. Angels. So they're real. And Stephen said when he was martyred, into thy hands, Lord, I'm dying. I commit my spirit to you. Well, I've gone on several rabbit trails. But let me, let, let me say a few things here. James says that the body without the spirit is dead. Psalms 115 says the, pr the dead praise not. Now I, I may lose a few friends over this or somebody may contest me on this. But as much as we have been taught concerning the intermediate state of, we'll say, the Christian or the saint, your blessed, righteous, godly grandmother is not walking the streets of gold or drinking from the river of life or eating fruit off of the trees or dancing around the throne your grandmother is dead what makes the difference is someday when the spirit of God comes back into that 
body, whatever form that body may be in, and raises that from a corruptible state to an incorruptible state, and we call that the resurrection. Amen. That's what we believe, and I believe that's what the apostles taught. The resurrection. That was the big issue of the day. Paul said to Agrippa, don't you believe that God can even raise the dead? Well, but what about that verse, absent from the body, present with the Lord? It doesn't mean your flesh is present with the Lord. It doesn't mean your soul is present with the Lord, because your soul is not a disembodied spirit. It's your spirit that's present with the Lord. And another, another thing. Stalin was a mean man. Stalin is not burning in hell right now. He's never had a trial yet. Because the Bible says that the unjust are going to be raised and they're going to have to give an account of the deeds done in their body. That's their trial. So don't worry about him. He will receive his just reward or punishment. Now, I don't want to make this too lengthy, but I want to read you something. The immortality of the soul. Talking about the intermediate state. This is taken from the Jewish Encyclopedia under the entry, Immortality of the Soul. And I, I quote, it's a somewhat lengthy, but it's worth the read. Quote, The belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is a matter of philosophical or theological speculation rather than of simple faith, and is accordingly nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. Even the rabbis. As long as the soul was conceived to be merely a breath, and inseparably connected, if not identified with the life blood, no real substance could be ascribed to it. As soon as the breath or Spirit of God, which was believed to keep body and soul together, both in man and beast, is taken away or returns to God, the soul goes down to Sheol or Hades. There is there to lead a shadowy existence without life and consciousness. The belief in a continuous life of the soul, which underlines primitive ancestor worship, and the rites of necromancy, talking to the dead, practiced also in ancient Israel, was discouraged and suppressed by prophet and lawgiver as antagonistic to the belief in Yahweh, the God of life, the ruler of heaven and earth, whose reign was not extended over Sheol until post-exilic times. The belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought and chiefly through the philosophy, philosophy of Plato, its principal exponent, who was led to it through Orphic, I'll explain that in a minute, and Ellicinian mysteries in which Babylonian and Egyptian views were strangely blended. What is Orphic? It's Greek mythology Orpheus, who was a musician whose magic ability on the lyre, that uh, harp, affected beasts, rocks, and trees. He sought release for his dead wife from the underworld. And this Elysian or Elysian, we've all heard of the Elysian fields, Secret religious rites in ancient Greece celebrated every spring concerning the death and resurrection of vegetation. 
But it came through the Reformation somehow, the immortality of the soul. And St. Peter's Basilica was built, financed, on the belief of the immortality of the soul. Because John Tetzel, that Roman priest, went throughout Germany. They needed money in Rome, so he says, I've got a box here. If you drop in your coin, your relative will spring out of hell. If you're rich, you have to drop in more. Just imagine how much money the priests received to get JFK out of purgatory. He didn't get $10, let me tell you. It's a scam. So the above entry that we just read, number one, is not taught in Scripture. Number two, it's the underlying premise of primitive ancestor worship and the rights of talking to the dead. And it came from Plato. Now, do I quit here? Let me give you one other thing and I will stop. In the book of First Peter, the reason why I hesitate to leave this out is because so many people have asked me about this. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now, when I read this, I'm not going to observe the colon at the end of verse 18. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, that has brought us, even Adam Clark, the Methodist commentator, said that has brought us a lot of false beliefs that Jesus went to hell. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, Eight souls were saved by water. What is he saying? This word waited goes back to Genesis where God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but uh, 120 years shall be his limit. This is talking about the age before the flood of Noah. And the people that were preached to, it was the Spirit of Christ in Noah preaching to those people for 120 years. It does not say that Jesus went to hell. The Apostles' Creed says that, the Roman Catholic Church says that, but it's not correct. When Jesus was on the cross, He says, it is finished. There's where he paid the debt for our sin. I could go into this more, but it was the Spirit of Christ in Noah that was preaching to that generation of 120 years. So when the preacher uses the term at the altar call, my spirit shall not always strive with man. That is true. 
And it applies, but the interpretation is that it applied to the generation of Noah. There was a set time, because even the name Methuselah had a chronological time element to it. That when the flood, when he dies, the flood's going to come. The last thing here. Thank God for men like Thomas Brooks when he wrote these words. The adjuncts of hell, which are four, the place which is infernal, the time which is perpetual, the darkness which is unspeakable, the ministers and tormentors, the spirits and devils which are irreconcilable. Now these adjuncts of hell Christ is freed from. For the dignity of his person, it was not fit that the Son of God, the heir of heaven, should be shut up in hell, or that he should forever be tormented, who is never from God's presence sequestered, or that the light of the world should be closed up in darkness, or that he who binds evil spirits should be bound by them. Thomas Brooks. He lived a couple hundred years ago. There are, I didn't cover everything, but I think I covered enough. There are some things that we Christians, Paul said, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. We grow up with tradition, and we're comfortable with tradition. We're comfortable there, and we want to stay there. But Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. And why is it, folks, that we sitting in this congregation this morning believe something that no doubt no other church in this county believes that we are the house of Israel? Because we want truth. And when the truth came to us, we accepted that truth and it set us apart. Well, other truth will do the same thing. So let's just let God be God.